Hello, and welcome to episode 217 of AvTalk. I am Ian Pechnik, here as always with... Jason Rabinowitz. How's it going, Ian? It's going well, Jason. How are you, sir? I am well, thank you. We continue along with what appears to be, and I know the second I say this, that it will no longer be such a period, but a period of relative calm for the things that we talk about on this show. Bold statement right there. That's a yeah. bold statement. I mean, like putting the show together this week, I mean, there are certainly things to talk about. There are certainly things happening in the industry, but I feel like we're in that pre-air show lull where- There's a lot of not, things going on. Yeah. Yeah. Not much is happening you know, externally. Everything's kind of under the surface. And then come middle of June, when the Paris Air Show arrives- It seems like it's going to be a very busy summer. Yes. Don't forget IATA, AGM too. A whole lot of stuff is going to drop Uh in. Probably, you know, Turkish also ordering 6,000 airplanes maybe. So they're saving the best for the middle of the summer when everyone wants to be off and on vacation. Right. And yet, I mean, who doesn't love wearing a suit in Paris in the middle of June when it's 900 degrees or raining the entire time? Or both at the same time. Or both. Yes, indeed. Or both. So we have a good show this week. We have Brian Summers, who is the founder and editor of The Airline Observer, a newish publication. But Brian Summers is by no means newish. He's been around the industry for quite some time, writing and analyzing the aviation industry. And he's going to talk to us about the demise of the Northeast Alliance. That was the, or I guess is for the next few days, the alliance between American Airlines and JetBlue focusing on, Jason, I'll give you one guess what region it focused on. It might be the Northeast. It might be. It might be. But we'll have to find out from Brian a little bit later in the show. We'll have to get the judge's determination on (laughs) what region is impacted here. Does the Northeast violate the Sherman Act? Just saying the word Northeast. So we're going to talk to Brian about that a little bit later in the show. But we've got plenty to discuss before that. So let us jump in. Following on our conversation with Robert Sumwalt last week, who is the former chair of the National Transportation Safety Board here in the US, the current chair of the National Transportation Safety Board, Jennifer Homendy, had a in-person roundtable, which, you know, post-pandemic, side note, it's fun that you need to clarify whether or not things are going to be in person still, which our you know, pants I, I think required, is, is how maybe. Our pa- yes, our pants required. Good to know that ahead of time. It's DC, so I think pants are definitely required. But but General Hominy hosted a roundtable on runway incursions, and this involved some of the NTSB investigative staff, as well as airline operations personnel, pilots, dispatchers, air traffic controllers, things like that. The event was proactively looking for ways to make our skies safer, reflecting the agency's commitment to meeting the same high standards we ask of others. So a very interesting event and some news that came out of it. One of the things that Hamidi revealed during the roundtable was just how close the incident in Austin between the Southwest 737 that was departing and the FedEx 767 that was arriving was. Hamidi describing the single light and very small portion of the Southwest 737 that the FedEx pilot saw that induced the go around that saved the day. So that was a bit of interesting news. And the other side of things that I thought was very interesting was the focus of the roundtable. And we'll put a link in the show notes to kind of a readout and some reporting on what happened at the roundtable. I haven't been able to find a recording quite yet, but if we do, that'll also go in the show notes. Was that, that how many not directly contradicted Robert Sumwalt's comments from our show last week, but I think they were a little bit at odds with his comments that the training isn't necessarily the training needs to increase, but rather go back to basis where it was how many was saying that, you know, perhaps that new training is necessary. So it'll be interesting to see how the FAA's independent safety review teams report collates to the work that the NTSB is doing on the same subject. So, yeah. so something to keep an eye on. 
It's also interesting to remember that what the NTSB just hosted is, I believe, specific to runway incursion events, while as what the bigger multi-agency, not just NTSB working group will be looking at is beyond just runway incursions to all of the other safety-related incidents that have happened over the last year or two, some of which come to mind are the United 777 out of Honolulu, I believe, that almost found itself in the Pacific, sure. or the, I guess you could also throw in there, the Emirates 777 that almost found itself parked in a Dubai housing complex. So what they are doing, what Robert Sumwall is involved in, looks just beyond runway incursions. Well, what the NTSB did was just specifically, there was a really seemingly, at least subjectively, an increase in specifically runway incursions where yeah, right. maybe more training is necessary for that specific type of incident as sure. opposed to what the working group is looking at, which is all encompassing safety, safety, safety from from A to B, not just don't enter the runway where you're not supposed to enter the runway. <laughs> yes. But it's also interesting. I would like us to find a link to what the NTSB just hosted, the audio or transcript that I did not know that the pilot of the FedEx aircraft that went around instead of pancaking on the Southwest 737, I did not know that they made visual contact with, I guess, a single light on the 73 because we had suspected that maybe their technology helped them a little bit because UPS and FedEx are fairly unique in that they have some pretty high-tech thermal imaging on board their aircraft. And we didn't know whether or not that actually played a role in kind of saving the day there. So it seems like maybe not. And I'd love to know why not. Well, yeah, we don't know. We don't know how they saw it. So we don't know whether that enhanced vision system, enhanced flight vision system, if that was the assistive device that allowed right. them to see the aircraft. It may have been, but we just don't have that information yet. We'd love to know that answer. Yeah, I, I would love to. I mean, I'm very much looking forward to reading that report when it comes out. Sticking with things that we've already talked about, but we're going to keep talking about, Go First has some good news, bad news here, I guess, for the airline. They've won a ruling against their lessers that are trying to repossess the aircraft. The that initial ruling, well, it, it's interim, but continuing. The first round said you have bankruptcy protection and lessors cannot repossess their aircraft because by agreement and convention, they cannot repossess aircraft for airlines that are operating under bankruptcy protection. The lessors appealed that ruling and said, no, we want our aircraft back because the airline is basically hiding behind bankruptcy and there's no way that they're going to be operating again. But the ruling from a tribunal in India says that the lessors cannot take those aircraft back, at least not yet. So we'll see how this goes. The lessors are arguing that they canceled the leases before they applied for bankruptcy protection or received bankruptcy protection. But this seems like a lot of legal wrangling. And once again, the lawyers are going to be the winners in this respect. On the other side of things, Go First has again pushed back any restart of flights. It is now May 26th. So it's just when you download the podcast, just check and see if Go First flights are operating. Because it seems to be they just keep moving it back every Friday. So we'll, we'll not, see. Not great when they keep pushing it back, as we've talked many times about how the more, I mean, coming back at all from suspending operations is, is difficult enough. But the longer you go, the more difficult it becomes, the more people you lose, the more staff find jobs elsewhere. But yeah, fingers crossed there. Not an easy thing to come back from. No, but hopefully they can manage that. And that leads us to our on-again, off-again coverage of Jet Airways. I think this is 2.0, 2.5? 2.1 V1. 2.1 V1. There you go. They had an air operator certificate from May 20th, 2022 to May 19th, 2023. They no longer have that air operator certificate. That certificate mm. has expired. Now and what? it seems like Jet Airways no longer has much of a staff as well. There has been no request to extend the AOC. And it sounds like Jet Airways is not going to happen. They got yeah. a couple of planes painted. 
Yeah, not terribly surprising, I guess. Disappointing for everyone involved, but this would have been a very long lapse between the last time Jet Airways operated and, and the restart of that AOC. So yeah, not surprising. But man, India can't really catch a break right now, aviation-wise. No, it still boggles my mind that given the growth that the Indian market is seeing, the number of passengers that Indian airlines are going to carry, that there's not, I guess, more structural investment here. But perhaps we'll see that as Air India really begins to turn around and completes the Vistara merger and all of these things kind of fall into place. Speaking of mergers, it's entirely possible that by the time you are listening to the podcast this week, Lufthansa and Ita Airways will have announced their whatever they're going to announce. They've been in merger talks. Lufthansa wants to buy a portion of Ita, but what that portion is, how big it is, what the terms look like, we don't know, but it sounds like it could happen this week. That's nice, I guess. Yeah. Sounds like the Italian government might be getting a nice payday out of that, finally. Finally, finally, out of the whole Alitalia restructuring, it sounds at least initially like Lufthansa is going to take maybe a minority stake or a very high minority stake. And then within a few years, they will take a overwhelming majority stake. But those details aren't quite finalized yet. But this is a saga that I'm excited to just have to never talk about again. <laughs> but we'll have to talk about it again, I promise. Something will happen and we'll have to talk about it again. All right. If you insist... Let's keep it with Lufthansa. Lufthansa said when they ordered their 787s that they would opportunistically look to increase their wide body fleet. And the focus on that comment was in 787s and picking up NTU frames of 787s. But they're also doing the same with the A350. Lufthansa is going to pick up at least four frames from Irish Lesser Deucalion. They are former. Latam A350s that were, I think, three of which were parked and one of which is never put into service. So, I mean, not very new. I mean, they're not brand new frames, but they're not very well used frames either. Let's see, three are from 2016 and one is from 2019. Yeah, and these are some of those types of stereotypical poor frames that just can't ever find a permanent home. I think they started at Heinen and then went to Latam and now they're going to Lufthansa. Maybe they'll find a permanent home at Lufthansa. I'm a little surprised Delta's not taking them since Delta's taken a whole bunch of other A350s from Latam. But hopefully these aircraft find their actual forever home, as you would call it, for <laughs> a pet, I guess. Makes the A350 sound like a puppy. Well, these aircraft, they've been looking for a home for a while. And, and none of the airlines they have been assigned to have been too financially stable. I guess certainly not Heinen. Latam went through bankruptcy, was it? I don't know. But yeah, they did. Lufthansa seems like a nice, steady home where they'll be wanted and loved. You know what I, I don't know that I would love to find out, and I'm sure somebody out there knows, is Heinen the airline that has ordered the most aircraft and not taken delivery of them? Ooh, that's possible. I feel like there's – if you name an aircraft type, Heinen has at some point had an order for that aircraft, probably except the A380. But yeah, it seems like anytime you come across an aircraft that was NTU not taken up, Heinen had something to do with it. They, they were some involved point. somehow. If it wasn't Heinen, it was probably Avianca or one of the many Aviancas. Yeah, between those two, yeah, some aircraft just don't ever find a true home. But these – Four or possibly six A350s. They're going to get their home. <laughs> I love how you've taken a, an emotional attachment to these four A350s. I'm enjoying the softer side of you, Yeah, yeah they, they need a home. So this is a weird story that is a lot of back and forth. And they said, you said, we said, he said, she said. Nice Air was a virtual airline based in Iceland. And they flew out of the airport in northern Iceland, Akureyri, I think is how you pronounce it, probably yeah, I'm not. I'm sure you got that completely right. 
but mm-hmm. I'll work on it. Anyway, they flew out of Northern Iceland and they operate or they had Highfly Malta operate an A319 for them. And that was their only aircraft. And they operated for less than a year. And in May, they had to suspend flights because Highfly took the plane back. And huh. then it turned out that the aircraft was being repossessed by Lessor Avalon. Repossessed from Highfly. Correct. And so Nice Air, an airline who was banking on Highfly having this plane available so that they could operate, they so Nice Air says that you know the aircraft was repossessed because Highfly wasn't making payments on it. Highfly says no. Nice Air was not in compliance with the contract's terms. So at this point, Nice Air is filing for bankruptcy because they don't have a plane. Well, that sucks. Yeah. I don't know what else to say about that. Very odd that an aircraft would be repossessed from Hi Fly Malta. They're not exactly. Well, here's the thing, though. Here's where it gets even more interesting. How? But continue. Hi Fly says that they owned the plane and they moved the plane out of service with Nice Air because Nice Air wasn't paying for it. And now it's operating with somebody else. What? Yep. That just raises further questions. Not following that plan. The whole thing is just very, like, very clearly there was a massive disagreement somewhere. Somebody wasn't doing something that they were supposed to do. And now the airline's going bankrupt. Huh, that's not great. All your eggs in one basket. I mean, you better be sure that that's a really good basket. Yeah, a really good aircraft, but apparently yeah. not. Man, that's a really weird story. Yeah, I mean, it's just like one of those things like and if there was financial difficulties like sure, okay, but just very very strange to like blame it on the repossession of the aircraft. If in fact the aircraft cannot be repossessed, because it's owned by the operating carrier. Yeah, we'll, we'll have to come back to this one when we have some more information and some more facts. There's are known definitely more to the story. Things are not quite lining up right now as they're presented. I will give you. Do you want three guesses, or do you want to make it tough? And I'll give you one guess to who the aircraft is operating with now. It's operating on wet lease to a European carrier, Air Baltic. Oh, that wasn't even tough, was it? No, that way you didn't even have to give me a I second just, to think about that. If there is one airline in, in all of Europe that needs an aircraft and needs it now, it is Air Baltic. That's what it is. That was not staged. We did not have that in the notes. That is just the obvious That answer. was good. That was, that was very good, Jason. Well done. Okay, let's move a little bit further east from Latvia than where we last <laughs> left things and talk about – we've got some Russian airline and aviation news to get through. One bit of news is a bit surprising. Russia has stopped nearly all of its long haul flying, mostly because it couldn't fly to any countries that were outside of Russia that were a ways away without risking having the aircraft repossessed. Cuba is not such a place where Russian airlines need to be concerned with having the aircraft repossessed. And so, Rosaya will start operating from Kazan to Havana three times a week, beginning in late June, early July. And Mm. Nordwind is going to run charters as well. Yeah, that we know they can do that flight. Yeah, we we know they can do that flight in one hop, no problem. But wonder what happens that one day where they have a diversion because of some sort of mechanical issue or, or medical issue, and maybe they do have to land somewhere where they're not expecting. I wonder if and how quickly that aircraft will be repossessed. That's a very good question. Yeah. I'm not really liking that because I feel like maybe they wouldn't do the right thing in the event of a medical issue or or maybe even mechanical. Maybe they would refuse to divert unless they really, really, really needed to. But yeah, that's- I mean, that's a lot of open water. It is a lot of open water. But when you got to divert, you got to go somewhere. And for a good portion of that flight, the nearest anywhere- is right here in the US and Canada. So I don't know. I don't know either, but it'll be interesting to find out what happens. Mm -hmm. Elsewhere, UTER is grounding 30% of its helicopter fleet. 30? How many helicopters do they have? 300. 300? I mean, I knew they 
had a lot of helicopters. They even have it on their fleet page. They have little bells and they have gigantic like Soviet era freight helicopters, heavy lifts. They've got everything. They got everything. But wow, 30%. It's a big number. Yeah. So they operate a variety of Airbus helicopters and they can't get parts for those. And they also operate a number of MI-26 helicopters that are powered by engines that come from Ukraine. So they can't get those either. And so their supply chains are uh, broken and now they're going to start grounding up to 30% of its fleet. That's a lot of helicopters to to keep on the ground. It is. I've always been a little fascinated with this airline too. It, it is. They have had a weird fleet for a long time. I think they still operate 767-200s with like 250 passengers on board. So that's that's interesting. They were an early adopter of in-flight Wi-Fi. I'm pretty sure their, their frequent flyer program is just called Status. So it is what it says it is. That's fun. Yeah, I did not know they had how many? 300 helicopters? <laughs> yeah, about 300. Wow. That's all. Well, not anymore. They don't. They still have them. They're still there. They just aren't flying all of them. And then the last bit of news in Russia is that the Sukhoi Superjet new, the SSJ new, is set to begin production next year. So that's the de-westernized or russified version of the SSJ, and that'll go into production next year. So they're, cool. they're making progress there. Yeah. Highly sought after aircraft right there. Mm -hmm. As if the international variant wasn't crappy enough, the new, I'm sure, will will be a a big seller by force. It'll be there. It will be an option. Yes, it will be an option. So the next thing we're going to talk about eases us into a conversation with Brian Summers, and that is the fact that the European Commission and the US DOJ are not keen at all it seems, on the merger between ASEANA and Korean Air. Yeah, me neither. I I don't think my opinion matters, but I I don't like it. I don't like that too. So the US is concerned about the consolidation and removal of any competition on most routes between the US and South Korea. And the European Commission is very concerned about the elimination of competition on most routes into Europe, but especially on the cargo routes between South Korea and Europe writ large. Less concern about passengers there because there's there's some more options in various cities and European carriers flying to South Korea. But it doesn't look like this merger is going to go through at this point. And both of those airlines have fairly extensive dedicated freighter fleets, I believe, right? Yes, correct. So yeah, I can see how that could be a concern. There aren't aren't that all that many passenger airlines with a dedicated freighter fleet, but but these two are 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 one of two of the more prominent examples of that. And you know, Seoul being a huge cargo hub, not great for the chances of this merger going through. So. I'm not sure what the end game is here, how they back out of it, what they try and do instead, but it doesn't seem like the merger is going to go through as as written so far. Let's take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll chat with Brian Summers about the entangling alliances in the Northeast and how they're about to be unentangled. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We are now joined by Brian Summers, who is the founder and editor of the Airline Observer. He is a longtime aviation industry journalist and analyst, and he has graciously joined us today to talk about the Northeast Alliance, what it was, what it is for the next few days, and what that all means for JetBlue, American Airlines, and the future of industry consolidation. Brian, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. I'm a big fan of the show. Hey, Brian. Thanks for joining, who is definitely not Brett Snyder. So sorry about that again, but welcome. (laughs) Happy to have this corrected on the record. All press is good press, Jason. (laughs) We've now had both of you on the show. So so at one point, we'll have to have both of you on the show together and we'll play some sort of Brett or Brian game. But as our regular listeners know, there was kind of a big shakeup in the industry last week. And Friday we news wanted dump to- too. That came out like Friday at five. Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. And we wanted to dive into it this week. So, Brian, you've been covering kind of the movement of the NEA, the this court case coming up and, and now the ruling. So I think it might be worth starting with what is or or was is the Northeast Alliance between JetBlue and American Airlines? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. As we all know, American Airlines has been undersized in the Northeast for a while, didn't want to compete so much in the New York region, but it had all these slots, right? And so Vasu Raja, the chief commercial officer over at American, came up with this grand idea that they would go into an alliance with JetBlue and essentially pool their resources. And it was it felt to me very close to these joint ventures that we see across the Atlantic. But there was one issue that they didn't have. You know, British Airways and American have antitrust immunity across the Atlantic. So they can't be sued by the Justice Department for pooling their resources. American and JetBlue got buy-in here to pool resources on the East Coast from the Department of Transportation, but not the Department of Justice. And as the listeners know, and you know, DOJ sued a couple of years ago to stop this Northeast Alliance. There was a trial last week. And as you say, the decision just came out recently. The judge had a lot of things to say, and it seemed like most of this turned on the judge's actual interpretation of what exactly competition means. And I'll pull this one quote. This case turns on what, quote, competition, unquote, means. To the defendants, competition is enhanced if they join forces to unseat a powerful rival. The Sherman Act, however, has a different focus. Federal antitrust law is not concerned with making individual competitors larger or more powerful. It aims to preserve the free functioning of markets and foster participation by a diverse array of competitors. So can you tell us a little about what exactly JetBlue and American were trying to do here? Because it sounds like they were trying to band together to compete against somebody. And I have a feeling you're going to tell me it's it's probably Delta. But what were they trying to accomplish with this? NEA? Yeah, the, the two airlines were trying to compete against Delta in, in New York and Boston. And they were also trying to compete against United, which is essentially a, a New York airline at Newark. Thank and you for clarifying that. That's important. As you say, the judge said, like, it's great. You two airlines are undersized in these key markets. But under the Antitrust Act, which is like I think more than a hundred years old, like you guys being undersized is not the government's problem. They were still, you know, I, I don't know if you want to use the C word, colluding. I mean, they they were doing things, you know, it was all out in the open. But they were doing things that we as kind of airline analysts know are usually a no-no, right? They would get together and decide, okay, JetBlue, you're gonna fly this route from Boston. American, you're going to fly this route from New York. In some cases, they decided that it was not necessary for both airlines to fly the same routes. At other points, according to the decision, they decided one airline would fly at one time of the day, one airline would fly at another time of the day, which makes them not really competitors. They had revenue sharing going in some ways. They were acting more like one airline than is typical in an alliance without antitrust immunity. Forgive my ignorance here, but they got approval from the Department of Transportation to do what and stopped from going to the DOJ. Why? Okay. Well, let's see. Gentlemen, I've been media (laughs) trained. I don't know if you've been media trained. And one of the things that you learn in media training is that you should not you should not opine on something that you don't know about. And it's not that I don't know about this as an airline analyst. But these are questions better posed, I think, to antitrust lawyers or lawyers in general. But my basic understanding is, you know, this was a decision by the DOT under the Trump administration, which was, you know, essentially approving anything at that point. And the DOJ has the right to not go along with the DOT. And, you know, when the Biden administration came in and the DOJ changed, they said, no, this is not right. So they sued to stop it. I mean, that to me, I mean, as a timeline certainly makes sense. So what happens now that a judge has basically taken an ax to JetBlue and Americans agreement? You guys need an antitrust lawyer on the show. (laughs) (laughs) Do we know any of those? I don't think we know any of those. (laughs) Look, the decision says the airlines have 30 days to unwind this. That clock has already started as we're talking here. 
I think it's possible that the airlines are going to appeal this. We just don't know for certain. Both airlines put out pretty brief statements that said, you know, they were thinking about their next steps, but I don't think the A word appeal appeared in those. I don't believe it did. Yeah. No. So it's really just like not clear what happens next. And I, I guess I'm the guest that's supposed to answer that question, but I just don't know. I don't think they know yet, but we do know that they were given a very tight window here, just 30 days to unwind what has taken years to put together here. And of course, we're just getting into the start of the summer season. Airline resources are hanging on by a thread. The FAA is hanging on by a thread. And this is going to be really, really complicated if they do actually have to go and unwind the NEA. A lot of routes served by JetBlue, but not American, will suddenly, I don't know, be reversed and a lot of rebooking will happen. Like right now, LaGuardia to Boston, a prime, very lucrative at times shuttle route. American doesn't even fly it. They tossed all that over to JetBlue. So I can't imagine that in 26 days, American just won't have any route options between Boston and New York. That would be crazy. So I'd have to imagine there's some sort of stay issued here or appeal, but you're right. Neither of them have, have actually said that the scary A word. Yeah. I just want to point out that that LaGuardia Boston situation, which was pointed out by the judge, you know, does seem to the outsider, to the non-legal mind as a pretty good example of how, you know, the NAA might not have been as pro-consumer as the airlines made it out to be with American that had been on this, this route forever. You know, US Airways had it. And be like, yeah, we're not going to fly this very key route between two business cities anymore. We're just going to let JetBlue do it for us. You imagine when American comes back on the route, if they do it for strategic reasons, right? Prices probably will go down. Consumers will probably benefit. I hope so. And yeah, you're right. That was a prime example of competition because JetBlue only a few years ago probably 2017, 2018, started heavily competing in the shuttle market directly against American by offering what they called a shuttle route between LaGuardia at a terminal A in Boston. And suddenly, American's not involved at all in that anymore. It certainly seems anti-consumer from my point of view here in a route I sometimes fly, but I do understand why the judge would really hone in on that particular route and saying, how is this possibly consumer-friendly? So, Brian, I know you're not an antitrust lawyer. I know that. But from an operational perspective, how does this decision impact the airlines right now? And say they do unwind it, what are we likely to see operationally? Oh, I don't know. Operationally? How do you mean? Do you think that American says, okay, now we're just going to fly all these routes? Or do you think we just see holes in kind of in the Northeast for a while. Okay. So, so I better understand the question now. I think a lot of us know years ago, American was based in New York. New York is the biggest city in the United States. And maybe if New York was any other city, American might, you know, take its ball and go home. They have that gorgeous newish terminal over there. Like, I can't imagine them shrinking New York anymore. It's an important route or it's an important city for them. There's actually like tucked in this 94 page decision. There's an excerpt of an email that a board member wrote to Robert Isom. And he said, like, you can't pull out of New York. New York is New York. I imagine that American will find a way to, to bulk up there. I've covered Vasu Raja at American for, for a long time. And he's always kind of whined about what he's been calling strategic routes, which he once told me were, you know, routes that you fly for some reason that you hope will make money in the future, but make absolutely no money now or lose money now. And so you imagine if American has to go back into New York, they're going to lose a lot of money there. But the best argument that I can make is that New York is New York. And I just don't see how you seed that market to United and Delta. And so what are we looking at? as the impacts on JetBlue kind of moving forward. I mean, their merger with Spirit is under legal threat from the DOJ. The DOJ is arguing against it. Spirit and Spirit and JetBlue are arguing in favor, though. I mean, Spirit has, has just kind of been along for the ride mostly and just wants to see the return for their shareholders. So where does this kind of leave JetBlue? That's a good question. Listeners know and may know, and you know that I, I live in Los Angeles. And so I think about JetBlue, I don't know absolutely none of the time, except when I'm questioning why East Coasters are so obsessed with the airline. 
you know, JetBlue is essentially like a regional U.S. airline with three hubs in Fort Lauderdale, Boston, and New York. And they are just so desperate to get the size and scale that they need to, you know, compete with the big boys. I sort of found as an observer that maybe the NEA over time wasn't all that important to them. Once once they kind of got in their minds that they wanted to bulk up by buying Spirit, the NAA may have become a little little less important to them. America needed it because they were just so undersized in New York and Boston. JetBlue has decent scale out there. What it needs is kind of a nationwide footprint. And so that's why I expected to go all in on this Spirit thing. Does the loss of the NEA or, or this particular ruling impact JetBlue's ability to to kind of horse trade its way into merger approval? Do you see that in this or is it really too early to say because the DOJ seems to be gunning for any consolidation that doesn't make sense? Yeah, it's so hard for me to way. know. Probably another better question for an antitrust lawyer. <laughs> I don't know what horse trading there is left to do. I mean, they, they lost this case. Right. So what, what are they going to say? <laughs> well, we lost the case, but we'll, we won't do the NEA anyways. So we does that do make you happy, DOJ? So I guess there's one thing I do want to go back to that it's pretty clear that the Northeast Alliance went at least one, probably many steps beyond what the DOJ felt was acceptable for two airlines working together here. But it's not uncommon, of course, to have two airlines having some sort of partnership. We see this with American and Alaska. We saw it previously with Delta and Alaska. We saw Delta and WestJet. Can you give us some background on, on what exactly set the NEA apart from other, I guess, formal, not alliances, but formal partnerships that fall well short of a merger or whatever the NEA actually turned out to be? Sure. Uh, the judge did a pretty long uh, discussion about this, about the American-Alaska alliance on the West Coast, the West Coast International Alliance, and he explained why the two things were different. So the Alaska-American deal is pretty standard in the industry, right? The airlines had a co-chair agreement and reciprocal frequent flyer benefits. The airlines historically haven't competed on that many routes, and they were kind of two airlines with different models. So the idea of this West Coast Alliance was that Alaska would keep doing uh, what it had always done, you know, fly short haul on the West Coast. And then American could fly long haul from Seattle. They were doing uh, Seattle, London. They had some ideas about other routes. And so, you know, you'd use Alaska to feed your long haul flights there. And it was a typical co-chair agreement. There wasn't any coordination of schedules uh, or things like that. And I believe that there was also a carve out, the judge said, there was no co-chair on routes that the two airlines had already flown. So maybe one of them would have been, you know, LA Seattle. So LA Seattle, there was no there was no code. Each airline handled it itself. And so, you know, we've seen these sorts of agreements over time. Regulators don't seem to mind them and it works fine. Do you think there's maybe a path that American and JetBlue maybe not completely dissolve their partnership, but but try to argue that, okay, maybe we went too far. Let's fall back to a more traditional partnership or alliance like American and Alaska? Or is this they fight tooth and nail to get it through or they give it up entirely? What do you see is more likely for the next step? Well, the, the judge certainly left that open that if you know the airlines you know, tried to follow what was done on the West Coast, that it, it might work. I just don't know how much appetite there is for, for this anymore. I mean, I'm not in the room at JetBlue or American trying to figure out what's going on, but as we talked about, uh, JetBlue has has other things cooking. The spirit thing is so important for them. And I don't know how much they want to salvage, but it'll be interesting to see what happens. I, I just think at this point, America needs this a lot more than JetBlue. That's true. But as is usual right now, it, it certainly feels like the only winners here are the lawyers at what American about consumers? and JetBlue. Consumers, I mean, to be seen, we, we don't really know what the outcome of this will be. But yeah, if we could get some competition back in New York and, and have American operate on routes that is traditionally operated and JetBlue competing and offering better services and lower prices, then yeah, I will celebrate that as a win if, if that does 
happen. Just think about this, guys, because I have a West Coast bias. I feel I always feel like I'm the only reporter with a West Coast bias. But you have five airlines that are hubbed in Los Angeles, none of whom probably makes very much money, some of whom probably lose money. And they all try to stay roughly the same size in LA for strategic reasons. And I, as a traveler, benefit because I can fly Southwest, I can fly uh, Alaska, United, American. They all fly to roughly the same places. And they do it because it's the second largest city in the United States. And if you run away from LA, then you're not relevant to your corporate customers in all kinds of places. And if you run away from LA, then one of your competitors takes your real estate. And I just imagine that American is going to look back and say, we do this in LA, We're going to have to compete in New York because if we don't compete in New York, somebody else is going to take even more share from us. We're going to be less relevant. And over the long term, we're going to be in trouble. And we have the added complexity here in New York that you don't have in LA of slots. If you don't use them, you lose them. And JetBlue and American have, well, American forgot it had some slots recently and and lost them. So yeah, here it's even more vital that the, the airlines actually operate as much as they can. Otherwise, a competitor, like you said, will very quickly snatch up those slots and open up some new competition. Well, the clock is now less than 30 days for the ruling says that this Northeast lines must be unwound in less than 30 days and the clock is ticking. It'll be interesting to see what the airlines do, whether they say okay and walk away or whether they appeal or they come up with something else. But we'll keep following the story and have Brian back hopefully in the future to take another look at this or any of the other things that he is observing because he is the founder and editor of the Airline Observer. Brian Summers, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, gentlemen. Thanks, Brian. Welcome back. I don't know what the, like we talked about before we talked with Brian about the end result between how Asiana and Korean Air kind of unwind their proposed merger. It still boggles my mind how you have 30 days to unwind something that's already been put into place where people have already booked tickets. Yeah, I don't know. I as we talked about, I I can't imagine a reality where thirty days is thirty days, and there's no extension or appealing that. But yeah, that's a lot of work to do for a lot of people out in, in Dallas and Long Island City, or Dallas Fort Worth. I'm sorry, I don't want to discount Fort Worth. How dare you, sir? I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> Let's see. Continued conversation about the utility of sustainable aviation fuel and its realistic promise to reduce emissions or just kind of exist as the case may be. There were some interesting comments this week from two folks at Boeing. The first was Boeing's CEO and Boeing's CEO basically said, yeah, SAF's going to be expensive. It's never going to be the cost. Jet fuel will always be cheaper. Fossil fuel will always be cheaper. And that's just how things are going to be. And then on the other side of that, Boeing's chief sustainability officer is saying that SAF is what's going to help us through to the other side. We're we're going to need SAF to make it through. And that's what we're betting on, you know, to expand the availability of SAF. And we're going to keep pushing this because we need to drastically scale up production of SAF in order to make it viable. So, I mean, and before we start recording, Jason, your comment to me was basically, well, duh. I I do remember saying that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think it's worth kind of calling attention to the fact that it's where you have the CEO of the duopoly of large aircraft manufacturers saying, this is going to be expensive. But their chief sustainability officers are arguing, well, we can scale up and we can do this and we can do that. I think that that it, we're starting to get to the point. And the article in the Financial Times that quotes Boeing CEO also quotes Willie Walsh, who is the former CEO of British Airways and who now runs IATA. And he says that we can do the SAF thing, meaning you know it, it's achievable to have enough SAF to kind of help transition to zero carbon emissions, but it's going to cost more. And I think that the industry willing to say 
that it is going to cost more to fly is an important inflection point that I haven't really seen people who sell tickets say all that much. People who crunch the numbers, people who look at where the industry is headed, people who analyze these things from an outside perspective have said that multiple times. But this is really, to me, the wide adoption of the line of it's going to cost more. It's always been true, but now people who sell tickets are saying that. I think they're saying that because it's an inevitable reality at this point. We have hit peak efficiency, I would say, of using fossil fuels in aviation. There are precious few things you can do to eke out anything to be quote unquote greener with that. And interestingly, just just today at the Future Traveler Experience Conference in, in Dublin today, Seth Miller, who's been on the show before, summarized a few of the points that were being said on, on stage about this. And one of them came from Sir Tim Clark of Emirates, who has been quite outspoken, I think, in this regard. And he's quoted saying here, we'll, we'll still have fossil fuels at the turn of the century, but perhaps only 15 to 20% of the demand, but not 100%. And he's, I think that's probably accurate. Weeding out fossil fuels 100% is probably just not going to happen within our lifetime. There were also a few other bits of interesting things I, I wanted to pull out from what Seth was able to summarize there. Tim Clark again saying on the hydrogen-powered A380 demonstrator that Airbus is, is will be doing in the very near future on hydrogen. He says, we're not there yet. Let's be honest. If you're going to power an A380 with hydrogen, the fuselage would have to be four times the size it is today to contain the hydrogen. So yeah, he, he's probably not wrong on that regard. He also goes on to say that it was a lot easier to clean up Aviation's Act 15 years ago when there were a lot of easy big wins to make to be less wasteful. And incrementally, it's going to be much more difficult to eke out additional wins and become incrementally greener. It's going to get more expensive. The, the further you go to becoming greener at eliminating fossil fuels and converting to hydrogen or electric or, or unducted fans or whatever, it's going to cost a lot more money and somebody has to pay for that. And it sure seems like in this reality, it's not going to be the shareholders paying for that. <laughs> going to be you and me in the form of a basic economy ticket. Mm, yay. I think that's where we are. Let's move to some quick notes that have happened over the past week. Al Air Algeri has firmed up its order for eight 737-9s. Those deliveries will begin in 2027. Scoot has chosen the E190 E2. It will take nine of those with deliveries between 2024 and 2025. So building a big fleet quickly. And then we have WestJet, which we talked about last week. They could be on strike by the time the podcast came out last week. Well, by the time the podcast came out last week, they weren't on strike. They had reached an agreement. And this week, American and its pilots reached an agreement in principle, subject to ratification by the larger pilots union membership. Hey, that's great. Everyone's agreeing on uh, everything, whether it's pilot contracts or contracts for aircraft and E-190 E-2s. Nine E-190 E-2s for Scoot is certainly an odd number. Not an aircraft I, I ever expected a, a subsidiary of Singapore Airlines to be operating, but there you have it. Jason, we like to troll the uh, airworthiness directives every once in a while for some good stuff. And a good one came out this week, I think. Yeah. I mean, by we looking at the airworthiness directives, I mean, Seth Miller and his uh, robot army likes to look through some of the filings. We like to look at the out. robot army is what I'm saying. Yeah. There's an interesting one out, uh, a new AD for the both the 737NG and the MAX. And I will quote what he said. Uh, an AD prompted by reports of uncommanded escape slide deployments in the passenger compartment caused by too much tension in the inflation cable and the movement of the escape slide assembly in the slide compartment. So basically that means slide go boom inside plane when you don't want it to. That's bad, but there's an airworthiness directive to fix it. That's good. <laughs> I'll have to find – there is video. I mean, there are many, many videos of escape slides inflating. But there's a video out there of an escape slide inflating inside of an aircraft. 
And and if Which I can track that good. down, no, it's 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 not. And if I can track that video down, I will put a link in the show notes. We close the show with another tender. Last week we talked about Thai Airways selling all of their aircraft. This week we discuss a. I'm not sure if it's unique, but it's certainly rare. Nepal Airlines is once again trying to sell its 757-200 Combi. Whoa, that's a rare breed. It is. So if anyone's in the market for a 757-200 Combi, you can certainly toss your hat into the ring for that. I'm pretty sure that if you give them enough money to let you take it away from Nepal, you could have it. Wow. A con- not even Iceland Air, I don't think, ever had a 757 combi. I, I don't know if well, I've Well, they ever- can have one now. They, they can have one now, but I'm not sure if I've ever seen one. I've been on a 747 combi. KLM had a bunch of those, but a 75 yeah. combi. Yeah, I, I want it. This is a 33, almost 34-year-old airframe that was delivered new to Nepal Airlines. Hmm, good for them. See, that so there you aircraft go. had a forever home. It did. And I can only assume that it will be Steve Giordano flying it to wherever it goes next. Oh, that guy. He's been all over recently. (laughs) If you haven't watched his most recent Cockpit Confidential videos, I highly recommend it. The most recent video he posted was like 50 minutes long. It is spectacular. As soon as you're done listening to this podcast, which should be in the next minute or so, go watch it. There you go. And have a great Friday while you're doing it, and we'll talk to you next week. This has been episode 217 of AvTalk. I am Ian Pechnik here, as always, with Jason Rabinowitz. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.